I don't want to be some Jocko willing Sigma male telling you to blend up broken glass with your own piss and then drink it for a morning shake. Yeah, buddy. Lightweight, baby! What's up, guys? I'm Josh and I Lift Things, and I'm here to talk about placebos, nocebos, and hypnotism. Do we only use 10% of our brains? Uh, hint. No, we do not. That's a dumb myth. From supplement studies to world record strongmen, tales of placebos and hypnotism are constantly talked about. But do they actually have any real impact on sports performance? Most of you probably have a general idea of what a placebo is, but for those of you that don't, let me give you a quick example. Let's take a person who was sick, and I gave them a pill that was entirely made out of sugar, but I convinced them that the pill cured all ailments. It is very possible that that person may notice a reduction in symptoms. The opposite of that, a nocebo, is also a thing. If someone was completely healthy and I gave them a sugar pill and told them that it causes all these awful side effects, they may actually begin to notice those side effects occurring. This is how researchers often test things such as supplements. Take a bunch of people and split them up into a couple groups. Give one group a supplement. You give another group a fake supplement and don't tell either group if they got the real thing or the fake. Hell, don't even let the researchers know which group got which treatment. Throw in another group as a control that neither got the supplement or the placebo. And this experiment would now be a randomized double blind placebo study, one of the most powerful that we have. If the group that got the actual medicine had better results than the placebo and the control group, then that medicine or supplement requires more research. If it doesn't, then it's more than likely a dud. But the implications of this go much, much further than just purely studying fat loss agents. Imagine that you were conditioned to think that this exercise is inherently better than another exercise. Is it at all possible if you were forced to perform the quote unquote worse exercise that you would maybe get worse results from it? The point that I'm trying to make is your mind controls everything. In a literal sense, your muscles will only contract after a signal is sent to it from your brain. In a more metaphorical, almost most esoteric kind of sense, how much are we limiting ourselves with our own self-enforced governor? And what the hell does this have to do with lifting? Well, let's let one of the strongest people on earth who happened to deadlift 500 kilograms or 1100 pounds do the talking for us. Scenario, feats of strength when they're put in a scenario. And it can't be fake. You can't click a finger and release it. It can't be fake. The only way to get it out of you is for someone to get a gun to your head, live or die, pull that weight off the floor. And obviously I can't do that on the day. I can't get someone to put a shotgun to my face and say, pull that 500 kilo. We have a hypnotherapist, we work together, and we got it to a point where I was able to create a scenario in my head that when I walked up to the 500 kilo, I wasn't lifting 500 kilo off the floor. To put it in retrospect, I was, I was lifting a car off of my kids. And that's the only way I was able to do that lift. I had to train my brain to put myself in this scenario. That wasn't the scenario I got in my head, by the way. I'm just giving you an example. The, the actual scenario is something that I cannot talk about because it's very dark, very deep, very disturbing. Now, this is a somewhat common trait shared by a lot of elite athletes. They seem to have this innate ability, or maybe they've even trained this ability, to turn on that switch to perform. Is this a genetic trait? Is it learned? Is it something that can be honed? I don't have the answers, but it's absolutely fascinating. Thankfully, researchers have been interested in this very question for decades, and there's a surprising amount of research revolving around placebo or mental state in regards to exercise and sports performance. Here's a study changes in self-concept and athletic performance of weightlifters through a cognitive hypnotic approach, an empirical study. So here, cognitive hypnotic imagery approach, or CHI, cognitive restructuring, CR, and hypnosis only, HO treatments on neuromuscular performance must muscular growth, reduction of anxiety, and enhancement of self-concept. They took 32 volunteer weightlifters, eight subjects were randomly assigned to each of the four treatment conditions conducted over a four-week period. The CHI group showed statistically significant treatment effects over other test groups on all six dependent variables from pre-test to post-test. From post-test one to post-test two, a time period in which no treatment was conducted, self-concept and muscular growth measures for CHI showed significance. The CHI group was statistically superior to all other conditions. Neuromuscular performance, supine barbell press mean increase of plus 23 pounds and muscular growth arm and chest measurement mean increase of 0.5 inches were dramatically and positively modified by CHI. 
It appears that combining hypnotic relaxation and imagery with cognitive restructuring enhances both the immediate and long-range effects of treatment. Here's a study, hypnotic susceptibility in the attainment of flow-like states during exercise. So hypnotic susceptibility in prior experience were investigated as correlates of flow-like states during exercise. Heart rate was also examined as a potential correlate of flow. Circuit trainers, 96 of them, completed a 10-item flow questionnaire and recorded their heart rates as they moved between exercise stations. Results indicated that self-reports of flow-like states increased from early to late in the exercise sessions, but that the magnitude of change was greater for participants high in hypnotic susceptibility than for those in low hypnotic susceptibility. Prior experience was also significantly related to flow ratings, with participants having more than six months of prior experience providing higher ratings than those with less than six months. No significant relationship was observed between exercise heart rate and self-reports of flow. This is very interesting. In this study, supposedly, going into a flow state like state of being had no effect on actual heart rate, but on a questionnaire of susceptibility of being able to be hypnotized or going into a flow state, these people were actually able to easier get into it, which means maybe it is innate, but also people with more experience of it were able to get into it easier. So maybe it is also a learned trait. Here we have the hypnotic manipulation of effort sensed during dynamic exercise or cardiovascular responses and brain activation. Very big study, but here in the conclusions, the hypnotic manipulation of effort sensed during dynamic exercise can significantly alter patterns of brain activation and elicit cardiovascular changes. Increases in effort sense elevated both heart rate and blood pressure, yet reductions in effort sense did not decrease either variable. This lack of cardiovascular change in response to a decreased effort sense serves to confirm the importance of afferent input from the exercising skeletal muscle in establishing the magnitude of cardiovascular response required to sustain a given metabolic demand. Although these data cannot address the specific mechanism involved in the cardiovascular changes resulting from an increase in effort sense during a consistent low dynamic exercise, we would postulate an alteration in the arterial barrel reflex. Here we have the effect of hypnotic suggestion on knee extensor neuromuscular properties and resting in fatigue states. Hypnotic suggestions did not alter neuromuscular properties of the knee extensor muscles under resting condition or during slash after exercise, suggesting that hypnosis induced improvement in exercise performance and enhanced corticospinal excitability might be limited to highly susceptible participants. Highly susceptible. Very interesting. Here is a comparison of placebo and nocebo effects on objective and subjective postural stability, a double-edged sword. Our findings indicate that positive and negative performance expectations evoked by instructional manipulation can profoundly influence both objective and subjective postural stability. Postural control and perceptions regarding such are clearly susceptible to expectation manipulation which could have important practical implications and repercussions on testing, training interventions, and rehabilitation programs. Positive and negative expectancies are a double-edged sword for postural control. Here we have a placebo effect in sports performance, a brief review. Here it says, all examined placebo effects associated with the administration of an inert substance, so one that does nothing, believed by subjects to be an ergogenic aid, meaning they thought that it would do something. Placebo effects of varying magnitudes were reported in studies addressing sports from weightlifting to endurance cycling. Findings suggest that the psychological variables such as motivation, expectancy, and conditioning, and the interaction of these variables with physiological variables might be significant factors in driving both positive and negative outcomes. Effects of placebo on bench throw performance on Paralympic weightlifting athletes, a pilot study. So according to the results, mean velocity and mean propulsive velocity at 50% of one rep max were significantly higher during placebo than control. However, there was no difference between control and placebo for 60, 70, and 80%. Our results suggest the placebo intake when the athletes were informed they were taking caffeine might be an efficient strategy to improve the performance of explosive movements in Paralympic weightlifting athletes when using low loads. This brings the possibility of using placebo in order to increase performance, which might reduce the risks associated with ergogenic aids, such as the side effects and positive doping testing. Here's placebo effects in sports and exercise, a meta-analysis. In various sports, examples cycle running and weightlifting, the investigation of the placebo effect on various physiological or performance measures like muscle power, heart rate, and running speed, and psychological attributes like perceived exertion, post-experiment interviews, yielded significant results. Indeed, the common finding of the reviewed studies was that from the point of view of the athletes, there is a substantial performance enhancement as a result of different forms of placebos. However, the interpretation of some of the results may be limited by methodological shortcomings. Here we have placebo-induced decrease in fatigue, evidence for essential action on the preparatory phase of movement. Here we show for the first time that a placebo, which subjects believe to be endurance increase in caffeine, reduced fatigue by acting at the central level on the preparatory phase of movement. In fact, we recorded that readiness potential, which is the expression of the preparatory phase of movement at the level of the supplementary motor area. 
during repeated flexions of the index finger in a control group that did not receive any treatment and in a placebo group that received placebo caffeine. In the control, as the number of flexions increased, both fatigue and readiness potential amplitude increased. By contrast, in the placebo group, as the number of flexions increased, we found a decrease in perceived exertion along with no increase in readiness potential amplitude. This placebo-induced modulation of the readiness potential suggests that placebo reduced fatigue by acting centrally during the anticipatory phase of movement, thus emphasizing the important role of the central nervous system in the generation of fatigue. Literally, people that got nothing experienced less fatigue because they thought they got something, and not psychologically, actual, physical, able to measure readings. Another, quote, I put it in my head that the supplement would help me, end quote. Oakland placebo improves exercise performance in female cyclists. So Oakland placebo improved time to completion and mean power output during the TT, which would be the time trial. Individual data analysis showed that 11 individuals improved, 13 remained unchanged, and four worsened their performance with Oakland placebo. Heart rate, rate of perceived exertion, and blood lactate were not different between sessions. Positive expectation did not appear necessary to induce performance improvements, suggesting unconscious processes occurred, although a lack of an improvement appeared to be associated with a lack of belief. Open placebo improved one kilometer cycling time trial performance in trained female cyclists. Although the intervention was successful for some individuals, individual variation was high, and some athletes did not respond or even performed worse. Thus, open placebo intervention should be carefully considered by coaches and practitioners while further studies are warranted. Keep in mind here, they did explain what an open placebo was to the participant, which, while probably ethical, maybe altered results. Here we have variability of exercise performance during long-term placebo treatment. Here, parameters evaluated included heart rate, double product, and duration of exercise. There was no change in the maximal heart rate or the double product. On the other hand, duration increased. Thus, although treadmill testing showed reproducible measurements of maximal heart rate and double product over six months, exercise duration increased progressively. Here's a systematic review, the placebo and nocebo effect on sports performance. Studies that examine placebo and nocebo effects on an objective dependent variable on sports performance, which included a control or baseline condition were included in the analysis. Studies were classified into two categories of ergogenic aids, nutritional, and mechanical. Cohen's D effect sizes were calculated from 32 studies involving 1,513 participants. Small to moderate placebo effects were found for both placebo and nocebo effects and when separated by nutritional and mechanical ergogenic aids. The pooled effect size revealed a small to moderate effect size across all studies. Results suggest that placebo and nocebo effects can exert a small to moderate effect on sports performance. Here we have nocebo effects on perceived muscle soreness and exercise performance following unaccustomed resistance exercise, a pilot study. In the conclusions, nocebo effects in sport and exercise, especially resistance exercise, are unclear, and our early findings suggest that negative expectations may induce adverse responses following unaccustomed activity. Specifically, findings reveal that negative belief adversely impacts performance and range of motion following unfamiliar resistance exercise, while RPE and soreness were not exacerbated beyond controls. Based on current findings, coaches and practitioners should avoid inducing negative expectations during training. For example, if a coach emphasizes to their athletes that a training session will be extremely hard or make them sore, it's possible that this may have an impact on performance even days later. However, more follow-up study using larger sample sizes on the nocebo effect and resistance exercise is needed specifically on what induces negative expectations and how this may affect training responses in the field. So here's nocebo effects on motor performance, a systematic literature review. From the conclusion, in this systematic review, we found that the nocebo phenomenon is present in motor performance. Therefore, practitioners in performance enhancing and health promoting professions should be conscious of the adverse effects of negative communication and or interventions perceived by the client as harmful. And then finally, here we have understanding placebo and nocebo effects in the context of sport, a psychological perspective. And this study basically talks about how the bulk of sport research involving placebos and nocebos continues to be hampered by outdated definitions and conceptualizations of placebo effects and their mechanisms. This has implications not only for research but also application as nearly 50 percent of athletes report experiencing a beneficial placebo effect and a similar proportion of coaches report providing placebos to their athletes besides all of this and i realize i just threw a whole lot at you let's actually think about motivation in general anyone who's played sports can attest to this if you are super gassed after a play but a coach gives you a lot of information and a lot of motivation telling you what you did was right you're going to get a second win and you're going to be able to perform a little bit better just purely having that confidence. This alone can tell you that maybe you weren't so gassed after that play. The point of this video, besides just to highlight super interesting research in the field of sports psychology, 
is just to try to tell you that you can probably train harder or you maybe aren't training as hard as you think you are. I don't want to be some Jocko willing fucking Sigma male telling you to blend up broken glass with your own piss and then drink it for a morning shake. I just want to tell you that you probably count yourself out too early. Humans are capable of performing some truly miraculous things, things much harder than growing some muscle and pushing some weights. The next time you feel like not going to the gym or maybe that you took that set all the way to failure, really try to get down to the root of the issue and find that grit that's deep within all of us. And this video is going to serve as a jumping off point for my next couple of videos. It's going to cover a wide range of topics of things that supposedly increase performance, but may in fact be all in your mind. These things are going to be kind of similar to what's known as trigger points. For instance, there will be a video on mouth guards coming up. Does clenching down on a mouth guard actually help performance through things like irradiation? Or is it that once you put in that mouth guard, you're able to flip that switch yourself and tell you that it's time to perform? We will get into tons of different things from smelling salts to listening to music to everything else. So if you really like that idea for that series of videos, make sure you hit the subscribe button to see when a new one comes out. I'll be posting one every single Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And guys, that is the video. Make sure you hit the like button if you like it. Make sure you subscribe if you really like it. And then leave a comment letting me know what I forgot or maybe a time of placebo or nocebo impacted your sports performance. I respond to every single comment and it really helps out the channel. Finally, make sure you share to a buddy in case he's just a complete meathead that thinks that his brain has nothing to do with his performance. If you really like this style of content, you can follow all of these socials. The links will be down in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.